Hello and welcome to the Christmas edition of the wisdomfactory.net. I'm Heidi, being in Italy, the, let's say, the seat of the Catholic Church. <laughs> I'm living very near to Rome. And so Christmas is a big deal uh, here, always been. Now it's become a little bit commercialized as everywhere, but anyway, it's still, they have their cradles in all places and, you know, even living cradles. That means people representing uh, the figures and even real sheep and real cows <laughs> they bring about. So it's, it's a big tradition here. Uh, and we go cross over the ocean and there is Luke Hilly and Paul Smith. And we want to talk about Christmas and integral Christmas and integral perspective on Christmas. Before we do that, please introduce yourself. Say a little bit who you are, where you are, whatever, you know, so that the people who happen not to know you yet know who you are and what you can bring to them too. Luke? I'll go ahead, Paul. You can start. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Age, age before beauty. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Paul Smith. I'm a retired uh, pastor, and uh, I uh, write books. Uh, I wrote Integral Christianity, The Spirit's Call to Evolve, and a, a few others. And uh, for the last uh, six years, I've been retired. And uh, then I met uh, Luke Healy, who's here with us. And uh, together we co-founded the Integral Christian Network, which has been a very exciting journey and uh, in uh, helping people gather together who were interested in uh, uh, meditating and praying in a mystical way uh, together in a, what we call a we space. And so, uh, and that's where I met Heidi and uh, it's good to see everybody. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm Luke Healy, and uh, I'm here in Kansas City, in the center of the U.S. with Paul. We, we both live here, and I am a gatherer and a spiritual pioneer and a mystic who uh, has been, yeah, deeply informed by uh, Integral and the writings of the mystics throughout the years, and Christmas has played a part of that <laughs> for me and my connection to having personal experience with, with God. And um, yeah, like Paul said, I'm co-founder of the Integral Christian Network, and we've been working on that for a few years, and Paul and I are, are deeply connected um, spiritually as well as in that work, and uh, it's been a real, real joy to work in that uh, and starting that and gathering people together. I'm also yeah. a father. I have a one-year-old and a almost one and almost three. So I've got two little kids and, and that they certainly also, especially the almost three is kind of giving new life to Christmas uh, again and seeing it through his eyes. <laughs> yeah, this is wonderful. I remember that Christmas was very, very important for us in childhood because it's enchanting experiences, you know, and without that, I think we are missing out on something uh, that kids of today who don't have that anymore. Yeah, I'm so happy that you are shedding new light on Christianity because there was this uh, habit, let's say, in the passage from the blue stage, uh, using spiral dynamics to, to orient to the modern uh, times, where uh, religions were sort of pushed away and new religion arose in the form of atheism, you know, which is a sort of religion too, in my opinion, but uh, it wasn't seen as that. And then with the green stage, there came all sorts of spiritual explorations. And still there was a tendency to neglect Christianity, to refuse Christianity in our Western world. Also, our roots are Christian, you know, they are definitely Christian, we, even if we don't want to be Christians, but 2000 years of Christian culture and we are going in, we have it in our bones, in our blood and everywhere. So even the atheists, you can say they are Christian atheists. <laughs> anyway, 
uh, with that uh, beginning, I would love to explore what Christmas could mean from this different view on Christianity and which we have or you have now. And let's see how it could have a different meaning now with an integral framework than it had when we were children. I mean, for children, it's still fine when they think that, uh, you know, uh, the Christ is in the, uh, Jesus in the, in the cradle and is born. And that's, it's okay. And with all the Christmas trees and so on. But for us, probably it's not the same thing. So I would like to explore with you what is your experience and what you can say about Christmas. I might say that uh, uh, my friend Ken Wilbur is the primary uh, 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 person to articulate integral theory, and uh, that applies in a number of ways. One of what you just mentioned is, he says we don't need a new religion, we just need more advanced forms of our, of our, our current religion. So there's no reason for anybody to change religion, just, just get a new version of it. <laughs> and uh, uh, I uh, am working on a blog right now, what does that come out in next week? Uh, uh, Luke, uh, the uh, a new Christmas story. Oh, next week, yeah. Next week, okay. Right now, it's uh, I call it a new Christmas story. God in three D. It's a new way of looking at the Christmas story. Uh, Christianity's familiar and beautiful Christmas story is uh, about a heavenly Father sending His Son to be born into the world to save people from their despair, and who sends them His Spirit to comfort and guide them. And that's a very warm image of a God as a loving father, a self-giving son, and a comforting spirit. Uh, but uh, this uh, story only portrays one dimension of, uh, of God. And that's the, the intimate dim dimension, uh, the metaphor of personal relationship. And, and, and also, it's all male images. As one fellow at a conference I was at uh, to speak, he came up and said, I hear you're going to talk about the Trinity. And I said, yes. And he says, well, just don't tell us that God is two men and a bird. And I said, well, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to expand on the Trinity. And uh, so uh, I think uh, what uh, Integral does and the terms of uh, the three, what, what Wilbur calls the big three, which are the three basic perspectives of first person, second person, and third person. Uh, it gives us a new perspective on Christmas. For instance, uh, uh, instead of thinking of God as a father that sent his son, uh, we can think of the God beyond us, uh, the transpersonal God, who is uh, the, the God that we uh, have been newly introduced in our modern era with the cosmos, it's a God who's everywhere and everything and beyond us. And it's the, the awesome I am God that was revealed to Moses. And uh, this, is, this is the God behind the, the, the Father that Jesus talked about. And that puts a cosmic dimension to the Christmas story. And then uh, God uh, beyond us was born into the world in a breakthrough way in, the, in Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, he represents Emmanuel, or God beside us, that, uh, that personal dimension of God. And uh, then uh, Integral gives us a third dimension, which is uh, that uh, God uh, as the spirit, or uh, I understand the, when the Bible talks about spirit, it's talking about what we today call higher consciousness. Uh, that that higher consciousness reveals to us that we are all one, we are all divine, and that's God being us. And uh, that's, uh, that's what the, the baby Jesus grew up uh, to teach us about and let us know that he was the light of the world and so are we. He said we were. So that gives the, uh, to me, the Christmas story a three-dimensional approach. It's, it's, it's both vast and bigger, 
and it's also personal uh, in terms of uh, our own uh, inner self. Uh, so that's 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 the beginning way I would uh, I would see integral affects my vision of the Christmas story. It expands it to three dimensions, and it's like going to a movie in three D. It looks more real, and it's got depth and breadth. And so there's the cosmic God beyond us. There's the personal God with us. And there's the inner, our own identity as God being us. And uh, I see all that in the Christmas story. Yeah, thank you for this vision, or how do you say definition? Um, it seems that we were, when we traditionally see Jesus being born in the cradle and so on, that seems to be somebody else, something outside of us. And we find it lovely, beautiful, whatever, but it has not really so much to do with us. So that is only one dimension. And with integral, you, you say that there are other dimensions coming in. And uh, Luke, do you want first to, to say your version and then we, we can talk about that? You are still muted. Sorry, I think I want to continue on with uh, what Paul was saying, and then I can share some of my own additions to that, um, because it, it ties right into that with, um, you know, when I was younger, and I mentioned Christmas was, was always a very special time to me, and uh, especially in the midst of some of kind of some of some chaotic family life, and I sort of clung to Christmas was a a really special and, and particularly the idea of Emmanuel, right? God with us, God with us. And that's that second person dimension that Paul is talking about that, that God came down to humanity and was with us. And, and that was always, you know, a very special feeling of connection for me. Uh, and I think some of the transformation of that and continuation of that is to still have that, but but remove the otherness of it, like you're saying, to to also include this idea of incarnation that of course has been happening throughout all of history and you know Christ being present within creation within matter um, the divine within all things uh, but Christmas gives us a time and a space to specifically realize that and understand that and embrace that within ourselves that it's not just God with us but also God being us the divine incarnation that we have within ourselves and that's definitely a new dimension of Christmas uh, that doesn't always get talked about. Like you said, it's kind of Jesus is this other and this wonderful story about the baby in the manger. And we are also the baby in the manger in a way too. Right? So <laughs> that's been a significant transformation for me. Um, for my own version of how integral is informed uh, Christmas, uh, I'll say that, that honestly for me, it's still something that's ongoing it's still a process to understand how do we how do we uh how do i see this in my evolving understanding how do i celebrate christmas how do i enter into this with a spirit uh that that has this broader understanding that is more complex and also more inclusive uh that it that it sees christmas for the limitations and the ways that it's celebrated a lot of times um but also in some of the beauty that's already there. And that's a, a core integral principle as well of, of transcend and include. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of times we get, uh, maybe as we evolve and grow, there's, there's sort of this, oh, Christmas, you know, Jesus probably was in April or, you know, maybe 10 years later, if it even, you know, we get into all the kind of, uh, you know, critiques of it intellectually, uh, we get maybe overwhelmed by the commercialism of it and sort of the pageantry and the show that that has its shadow side. Um, but I think there's also that sense of including the wonder of it, including the the kind of joy um, and and peace and and some of that can certainly be you know maybe seem shallow, but there is also a depth to there that people have been celebrating this and and it's a time of seeking peace. Uh, you know, for, for a couple thousand years in a way, um, and, and a way to enter into sacred ritual, uh, where for a lot of people, they don't have that space in their life anymore. They don't, they don't have ways to, to enter into that as we have to kind of shed some of the, the forms that, that carry too much baggage. It's, it's almost like Christmas 
despite all the commercialism, despite all the, you know, uh, you know, stodgery that, that can come around it, there's still this sort of inner magic to it. Um, and that maybe is a healthy inclusion of some, some lower purple and, and, um, and blue and just kind of seeing that through the eyes of my child, right, is, is, is a huge experience for me of that, of just this wonder and this magic. And, and I think as we grow old and learn more, it's easy to lose that, that wonder, right? Um, but there's still mystery there. There's still something, um, at least in my own experience of it, I still, still get hints of that magic uh, around Christmas time. Maybe I'm naive for that, but <laughs> um, but I think that's something we can do. We can include. We don't have to to throw it all out. Um, so that's that's kind of my perspective where I'm at now, and I'm still kind of processing how to understand some of the you know theological implications or philosophical implications of how I should think about this time. But if I can move it into my heart space and my body and my being, I'm kind of like engaging in in sort of a energetic field that that exists around Christmas or something if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah it's fine I was thinking while you were talking um, at the end it's 2,000 years that Christianity has survived it seems to be threatened a little bit but it still has survived so that the message has some value no and when we say today and are against all the commercialization and everything, yes, it's not so nice, but at least it helps to, to have it surviving longer. And maybe, you know, maybe in the next time when we come to integral uh, awareness, maybe then we can reintroduce or re-include what was before. So I was thinking about uh, many people are complaining, oh, these rich people are here. They, there was a, a deputy of the Senate who lived a little bit before Rome, outside of Rome, and he succeeded to have a four lane street going right into Rome. And people said, oh, but only these people. And I said, be grateful because now you can use this road too. Otherwise it wouldn't be there. And so I think uh, of Christianity too, to help it survive, Maybe uh, these things, even if we don't like it because it's not so pure or whatever, but maybe this is a way how it can be longer. I mean, be uh, continue uh, existing, even if the meaning has a little bit changed in, in, you know, materialism, that's what it is. But it doesn't mean that it has to stay all the time there, you know. And so hopefully it will get the the real meaning. So the question to you, what do you think that the real meaning is? <laughs> the real, I mean, what, what do you think what the meaning is of the deeper meaning of Christmas? Luke, I loved uh, your phrase, and, and I haven't heard anybody say it before, or you say it. Uh, we are the baby in the manger. I just love that. Can I borrow that? <laughs> uh, that's a, uh, that's a very evolved view of who Jesus is. And another thing uh, Integral has given me is a, a new picture of Jesus. Uh, you know, we, we can all gather around uh, the, the nativity scene, oh, a cute little baby, uh, everybody could be for that. But then for many people, this little baby grew up to be uh, Jesus in the traditional sense, a Jesus who uh, sends uh, most of the world to hell and uh, who's, who's uh, concerned about uh, if you don't believe the right things or do the right things, uh, uh, then you're, you're not included in God's love. And uh, what Integral has done is said uh, that uh, Jesus uh, is, uh, we can evolve to a, a more realistic Jesus that was true to his nature when he grew up. And the uh, biblical writers were so enamored with Jesus. And, and, and I was thinking the other day, you know, when, you, when you're in love, you say to, to the one you love, oh, you're the most beautiful man or the most wonderful woman in the whole world. Well, not really, but we believe that, you know, we say that. And that's what the early Christians did with Jesus. Oh, oh, you're 
you're the only son of God. You're the only, only one who's come to reveal God to us. And you can understand that devotion, uh, but we have to look, look through it. Uh, we, we were all, we're, we, they were always talking about Jesus as the son of God. And Jesus called himself the son of man. So he was, he was more interested in being like us. And so uh, what, what uh, I have done is decided to treat uh, the teachings about Jesus like Jesus treated his Bible, which is he rejected some parts of his Bible. He uh, embraced some parts of his Bible and he ignored some parts. And I do the same with mine. And so Jesus emerges out of that, not as an exclusive Jesus, but as a universal person, uh, someone who loves everyone and, and has a God that includes everyone. And this is, a, this is a Jesus who is for everyone and that the Christ is universal regardless of his name. And he's not uh, choosy about his name or beliefs or doctrines. And this is, Jesus grew up to be this incredibly loving person whose love included everyone, especially the poor and the needy and the cast out and the sinner and the all ones we label as not, not belonging. Uh, he grew up to be a one that includes them, which is, which is a more evolved version than the traditional church has of the ins and the outs. And with Jesus, there were no outs. And so when I look at the, the baby Jesus, I see the same wonder and the same awe and the adult Jesus, not a Jesus who's, a, who's being uh, angry at the average person. Actually, the only people who got angry with were people like me, religious leaders. <laughs> so, uh, uh, because if you, if you tell a lie in the name of God, that's really a, really a dangerous thing. So it's really helped me have a, uh, a Jesus who's uh, more evolved and that I can follow freely and, and, and welcome today, just like I can fall in love with the baby in the manger. Yeah, thank you. And to the person of Jesus, people say that he might have been already in the integral stage of development while all around him were three or four levels lower. What do you think about that? Absolutely, absolutely. He was certainly way ahead of his time. Ken, Ken Wilber says he was, he was the master and we have not yet attained anywhere near to where he was. And uh, I, I, I think so. He had, to, he had to deal with the metaphors and concept of his day. And it's up to us to translate that into the integral of our day. But he certainly was a breakthrough, the breakthrough for Christians. Uh, Jesus defines God for Christians, but doesn't confine God. God's not confined to Jesus for Christians. And uh, so uh, that's the way I view him. And I think in that sense, Jesus was also really being integral, was great at speaking to the people of his day in language and symbols and stories that they could understand and really addressing the stages of where people were at. And so, mm -hmm. you know, when it, for me about the true meaning of Christmas, that's also um, we can't kind of boil it down to one kernel of truth that exists for all people for what Christmas is, right? Christmas is going to mean different things to different people at different stages. And part of being integral and in understanding that is allowing that and understanding that, um, you know, some people need a magical Jesus in a manger and, and that can be really wonderful for children. And some people need to reject Christmas and be kind of scroogey about it for a little while, right? <laughs> it's all part of our growth and evolution. And, um, and so for the true meaning, I think it boils down to, to where we're at as a culture, where we're at visually, um, and what we can take from it. And I think, yeah, a core piece of that uh, right now, I think for a lot of culture is that kind of owning of incarnation, that kind of embracing inner nature of this that it's um not just reality that exists out there that that jesus was a divine expression was the defined divine expression for christians but is the elder brother among many sons as it says mm -hmm. so um that's that's sort of biblical support for the we are the the jesus in the manger too that that we are we are the younger sons too and and sons and daughters 
And, uh, you know, Paul says that uh, a lot. He says, you know, the children of uh, the babies of sheep are sheep and the, the babies of cows are cows and the babies of um, gods are gods, right? So we are children of God in that sense. And uh, so I, I think there's something there for owning an inner identification of that idea of incarnation, which is a central principle for Christianity, right? And that's something that Christianity really probably hasn't done a very good job of embracing throughout its history in kind of um, vilifying the flesh and being afraid of embodiment. And so, you know, there's a sense of Jesus being a little baby and nursing at Mary's breast and being fully human in that sense. And so we, um, can own that embodiment of the divine nature within ourselves. And um, that's something that I'm exploring a lot in my own life and, and uh, spiritual expression. What I like to ask you is uh, the, we are gods, we are the, um, the little brothers of Jesus, you say. And we have learned in our culture, don't say that. You are, you know, you are exaggerated. You, you, it's even blasphemy when you call yourself God. So we have, in the last few decades, we have changed a little bit this, uh, these ideas. No, also because getting in touch with the Eastern religions, where uh, it's more normal, you know. So could you speak a little bit uh, about that? How it is not necessarily an expression of an inflated ego to say that we are also God. You want me to tackle that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, give me the hard stuff. <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to wear a t-shirt on it that says I am God, uh, but, I, but I might one, wear one that says uh, I, I, I am uh, in the process of owning my divinity, uh, or I am an infinite being. Uh, and, and we do have a, a traditional religion teaches it's a, it's a, it's a terrible sin to, uh, to say you're God, that God's so separate from us. Uh, but integral shows us in non-duality that none of us are separate from God and we're not separate from each other. And so, uh, to not be separate means we, we are a part of, as First Peter says, we're all participants in the divine nature. And Jesus said uh, that not only he was the light of the world, he said directly to all of us, you are the light of the world. Well, how can we be the light of the world if he's God and we're not? Uh, so uh, I think we do have to be careful about using the word God. I, I put it with a small g when I'm talking about us to make that distinction. Uh, but the, uh, the, the Eastern Orthodox Church has made it a, 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 pro, a central uh, doctrine, what they call deification or theosis, that we are all divine on the inside and coming to own that and, and be conformed to that inner divinity. And so we can find ways to talk about it. I call it God being us. Uh, so uh, uh, we are the hands and the feet and the voice of God now. We're it. I mean, God doesn't have any other hands and feet and voice except us. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, one way we own our divinity. And you do have to be careful theologically to, uh, to, to talk about this. And so uh, uh, Merton Thomas Merton talked about that we, we have a point of light within us. Uh, that's his way of talking about divinity. Uh, and uh, Meister Eckhart talked about we, we, uh, with the, the, uh, the eyes with which we see God or the eyes with which God sees us. And the, the ways of saying this, uh, Hoffitz, I love it, Hoffitz says, when you, when you want, to, want to kiss God, when no one is looking, lift your hand and kiss it. <laughs> and that's a very brave way of saying it. Uh, but I think if we keep the other two dimensions, that God is beyond us and God is beside us, then we can talk about God being us. It's only when, as Eastern traditions do sometimes, 
uh, and New Age traditions do. We only want to talk about God being us, and there is no God beside us, and there's no God beyond us, that we move to a, out of balance. So once again, those three dimensions of God held in balance are the answer to uh, falling off the cliff on either any of them. Uh, so that, that's the way I, I, uh, I see it. Yeah, it really comes down to our conception of God, right? And so holding those three, the 3D God, right? It, it keeps us from that inflation of ego because it's not just that I am God, there's a God vastly beyond us. And, and we use metaphors to, to try and point to that. But, you know, maybe we're not so evolved as we think we are a lot of times and we still carry so much baggage from the things that <laughs> our conceptions of God that have been handed down to us and that we've grown up with. And if we... <laughs> Of the word God as this authority figure, king in the sky that has power over everything, right? This sort of red <laughs> conception of, of God, then of course, if we say I am God, right? We think, oh, that's like this, this powerful king, like you have all that, like that mm -hmm. is. And so we have to use other words like divine nature uh, in, in, in Second Peter and um, just, it's very important the language that we choose to understand that, that as our picture of God evolves, that there's a dynamic, energetic, inner experience of God as a verb that is something that we all participate in. And just using the word God as a noun, right, sends us all back into those, <laughs> those old conceptions. So it's a matter of language, for sure, is a big part of that and, and holding a more evolved uh, understanding yeah. of God. When you were speaking before, I was thinking, if we are God, and we accept that, we humans, we are a very strange uh, mixture of good and evil, let's say. So that would mean that the same capacities or the same qualities are in God and they are expressed through us. Does it mean that? And how do we deal with it? I mean, there are so many in the, in the let's say, un naive understanding of God. What God is that if he allows a thing like Holocaust or something like this? So that cannot be a God. So what do you, what do you say about these negative uh, expressions of the divine? There are some voices who say we need the challenges to evolve. And to make things better? Is this a part? I don't know. Well, that's uh, why we need a God beyond us. Uh, that we can't solve the problem of evil um, intellectually. Uh, how could a good God allow or create evil? Uh, but, but experientially, as we move into this higher consciousness that Jesus had, uh, when, when we move into that, we ex experience everything as one. We experience uh, uh, no duality, uh, no separation. And so somehow or other, when we look at good and evil from that standpoint, they fit together. I, 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 uh, it, it, it isn't a problem. Now it's, it's not something you can describe or give an intellectual description of, but non-duality, or that inner oneness or unity of all things uh, that is Christ uh, is an experience of uh, that you can't can't describe. You can only see things that way and experience them that way, and you know there's no conflict in that. Uh, so, when, when, uh, if you're having a discussion about this, you stop and ask everybody to move into their transcendent consciousness and look at it from there. And if everybody can, everybody will say, oh, no problem. It's okay. Everything's one. <laughs> and then, then we can come back from that viewpoint and start working on making it one here on earth and, uh, and uh, moving evil into good as much as we can, which is what Jesus did. Yeah, I was thinking while you were speaking, uh, this the concept of good and evil is is human concept, no? Yes. Because when I think about animals, when they hunt for for eating, there is no good and bad. That is just what they do, you know. And we have developed to do more than just 
you know, kill animals for, for food, but we torture and do all sorts of things which animals never would do. So I think we can maybe explain it in worthy words in this way that uh, good and evil at the end is a, a human quality. Would you agree with that? And that we are called to to reunite that or to not not reunite to transcend this duality and come to to understanding that maybe something which we find bad in the next uh, moment maybe it's not bad so that we cannot define and we don't know what it is for this this god which is bigger than us who knows what <laughs> what he intense uh, when he is setting us in front of challenges yeah yeah you know the like paul said it's the the t-shirt the process i'm in a process of becoming a divine <laughs> being it's not just i'm god or i'm not god and one of my teachers another one of my teachers father richard Rohr, has really helpful language around this when he says that we have an image and a likeness of the divine so that everyone has an inner image of the divine that we can connect to and tap into and experience. And then there's also a likeness that we all experience that we have to work into and move into and work on because it is, you know, there are horrible things in the world and there is, there is evil. Uh, however, we want to understand that and our ideas and concepts of how we understand that in our mind w will always be evolving. But we have to acknowledge that, that that exists and that there's still um, a process that we have to participate in to be people of love and light and engaging in that process with one another to, to help bring out that nature of God within each one of us uh, is, is definitely important to, to also hold on to, I think. Yeah. Mm. And I was thinking, uh, Jesus was not all the time kind and lovely and whatever. When he had to step up and fight against something, he did. So uh, I think when we think about being divine beings, there's too much the idea that we always, you know, are nice and, and I don't know what. So we have to, to redefine what we think what divinity is in many ways. That's what I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, he could be he could be stern when he needed to be stern. He was stern when he went into the temple and saw the money changers in the only place in the temple where the Gentiles could worship. And uh, so he he wasn't mad at money changers. He was mad at excluding the Gentiles from the temple, and he got raging mad about that. He got he got mad at the evil of exclusion and separation that that represented uh so uh, he could uh, he could throw a good fit <laughs> yeah that's another interesting part of christmas that i've been noticing with my you know my young son who's almost three and we're we're talking about jesus and he wants to read the jesus book and we're singing away in a manger and <laughs> uh, it's interesting how a lot of the language is is very inclusive it's joy to the world it's peace on earth you know it's it's you know we bring in the wise men coming from you know gentiles and and it's not all just for the jewish people which was an evolution for that time um in in many ways um, it was there in, in, in the past in Hebrew prophets. Um, but, you know, a lot of other language in the, in the Christmas carols and the hymns I'm trying to teach to my son, I'm kind of like, oh, wait, no, you know, <laughs> <laughs> much there that how do we navigate that? You know, there, it, it's kind of the tension of religion, right? There's, there's always a, a paradox and a holding of some things that are more evolved and point to a, a greater reality that that we can grow into and beyond and then there's always some things there that make us kind of cringe and we want to just put it in the closet or change the words or it needs it needs to grow right it needs to evolve so that's um that's definitely a part of the process of <laughs> finding those good things finding the dynamics and, and i don't know how to do that with my my three-year-old son like we're gonna sing this song and oh do i need to rewrite that one and i <laughs> How do, how do we hold all of that? So we're doing that same thing. You know, I'm doing it for my three-year-old, but, but I feel like I'm also doing that for myself. Like what here 
what here is still growing and changing and evolving and how do I understand this story in light of, um, of my own evolution, my own personal experience. Um, that That's maybe just part of the human condition as we evolve with more complexity, more to sort through and, and uh, hold <laughs> the tension of the now and the not yet and all of that. That brings up the uh, whole thing of the language of Christmas songs and Christmas carols. And I've gone through several stages there. Uh, I used to not think anything about uh, calling God he and uh, king and all the male language uh, in, in, the, in the Christmas hymns and carols. And uh, then I, uh, my first book was called, Is It Okay to Call God Mother? Uh, considering the feminine image of God. And I became so conscious of that, that I uh, refused to call God him. I would either say God or I would call God she. And uh, this is in my sermons at church, of course, which drove some of the more patriarchal men crazy. And uh, uh, we, but it became a real problem at Christmas because the, the Christmas carols are so familiar. We rewrote all the other hymns. We used a projector to throw the hymn words on. So it was, it was okay to do that, but it was hard with the Christmas carols. But we did the best we could. And then it's interesting in my old age, <laughs> uh, I go ahead and sing the male words. Uh, I think, well, you know, uh, I, I know that God is not male or female, but includes both. And, uh, uh, but I'm not going to change that culture. And so I'll just join in singing this Christmas song. Uh, I used to, when I would visit another church and we'd sing a hymn with male words, I would sing female words and people around me would look over and say, what's the matter with him? And, uh, uh so I probably wouldn't do that now. I've, 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 I've gotten a little, a uh, little less, uh, uh, activist, I guess, in my old age, uh, but I still advocate the change, but I'm more comfortable with, with uh, adjusting, which is another integral principle. Uh, when you're with people at one stage, you adjust to their stage and communicate in their stage. And so I've even uh, lightened up on the male imagery of all these Christmas carols and calling God he and him. The thing with Christmas is that at least there is Mary and she is a she. So yes. of the few women who appear in, in the stories. So, uh, you know, um, the, the Protestant churches, they don't have Mary really included. So they are even more male than the Catholic Church. So Well, it's w what's interesting about Mary, there's been more appearances of Mary uh, in the last years than ever before. Uh, Mary as a spiritual guide and as a spiritual being appearing to people and being a, a personal guide to people. And the Catholic Church, uh, the, the hierarchy did not, did not elevate Mary. The elevation of Mary came from the people. The people needed a feminine presence. And so they made Mary that feminine presence and the Pope and the others decided to recognize it. And uh, it's interesting, the number of appearances and apparitions of Mary has increased, so, and, and it's increased in the Muslim population because uh, Islam talks about Mary more than Christianity does. In, in the uh, Quran, uh, she's very prominent. And so uh, Mary is not only having a place theologically, Mary's, Mary's being present to us now in greater and greater ways as is Mary Magdalene. Uh, both Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene are two of my spiritual guides, and they bring a, 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 a feminine presence to me. They hold my hands uh, while Jesus is present, uh, touching my right side, and uh, it, that's a very meaningful thing to me, uh, not just the Mary as a character in the Bible, but Mary as this wonderful, wonderful, delightful woman who holds my hand when I pray. This is wonderful. Did I just go off the deep end, Heidi? 
<laughs> no, no, wonderful. I, I was, I was thinking about the feminine presence and that yes, when you're a feminist, you are a little bit, you know, cross with religion because, yeah, it's we women in Catholic Church. Yeah, Mary is there, but still they cannot become priests, uh, women, and there are protests going on in Germany and uh, uh, all sorts of good. things. Yeah, that's good. Uh, the question is. What is it? What has excluded the feminine uh, in the churches and where they can practically they are welcome to do uh, volunteer wor work and do service work, but not do the sacred actions? Uh, do, do, I mean, this is apart from Christmas, but do you know where this comes from? That this uh, yes, uh, yes, it comes from men being in charge. The yeah, men were okay. in charge of Jesus' day, the warrior men, and yeah. the, the people who are in charge try to keep in charge and stay in charge. And the Catholic Church is so entrenched, it may be centuries before uh, we can have a woman be Pope or before we give up the Pope altogether. And uh, so uh, that's the, it's the same power grab that uh, men have been doing for a long, long time. And uh, democracy is helping there. Uh, but uh, progressive Christianity says God is male and female, and uh, male and female need to be together and united, and they're both important. And uh, I know when, when uh, in my church, which is the Southern Baptist Church, the first time I suggested we ordain a woman and call a woman as uh, one of my associate pastors, uh, you thought I said, said nobody was going to hell, which I also said. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it took a, took a while for people to adjust to that because we're, we're so used to patriarchy, we think it's normal and it's not. It's abnormal and it's a, it's a blot on, uh, on Christianity. Yeah, it, it, maybe it's abnormal now, but it was normal for a certain while. And that's also Ken Wilber, who is talking about the rise of the uh, solar masculine, no? when it, uh, the, the transition from the second to the third stage. So it was okay. And probably with religions is the case that they appeared when, when the male was already in charge, you know? And so uh, in, they, instead of... Uh, how is how, which way is it around? God made uh, the the man in His image. Man made God in His image, in their image. That's right. So, that's right. Yeah. So yeah. That's, yeah, and that's that's. I mean, again, it's that tension of recognizing those stages of development, those stages of evolution, and how enmeshed all of our religion. And experiences in that so while we try to affirm the healthy things in that and allow them and include them and still keep space for wonder and Christmas and and yet there's also a lot of really hard and damaging things in there like patriarchy mm -hmm. and, um, racism and you know all sorts of things that that we also have to contend with and that we have to deal with and and that's a big tension and and knowing how to navigate that in our religious spaces in our in our spaces of spiritual practice as well and and that's you know there's a lot of different ways that we can approach that <laughs> um but you know that's one of the reasons why we're doing the work that we're doing at integral christian network is this sense mm -hmm. that we see um and the the phrase that keeps coming to me is that um you know old wineskins won't hold new wine and so mm -hmm continue to evolve and grow and, and, and experience this new wine of, of uh, evolution and mystical understanding that uh, a lot of those old forms are going to have to go away. And I don't know what that means for Christmas, right? I don't know what that means for going to a, a pageant and, and big carols and we, maybe we have a soft spot in our heart for that. But, um, but we need to find new forms. We need to find new ways to invite people into spaces where they can experience uh, their spiritual expression um, that that really is liberating from some of these these old damages and injustices uh, in ways that that express um, you know as best as we can <laughs> evolution beyond patriarchy and um, and really owning that greater inclusivity uh, so so that's that's a lot of where my passion is of, of how do we 
be spiritual pioneers and how do we uh, discover and explore new ways to, um, you know, cause, cause those old ones are just so just enmeshed with so much of those things that, that the triggers are there, the allergies, um, sometimes it takes, some people need to stay there and do the work there. And, and some people need to, uh, go into exploring and, and developing new forms or something like that. Yeah. How would, how would, uh, an integral Christmas look like? I mean, without throwing away the, the tradition, but still not buying into the, the tradition as own, only thing. How would you envision that the people who don't feel like belonging to the church in, in this sense, in the old sense, how do <clears throat> they celebrate Christmas? It's just brainstorming. Well, it's interesting. I was... Uh... Uh, the, the Southern Baptists have bookstores uh, around the country, and uh, when I w w when we were still a Southern Baptist church, I would go to the Baptist bookstore for various things. And one day, the uh, the the manager of the bookstore came up and said, uh, "We uh, we have a nativity set that uh, that uh, they, they it has two Marys." and uh, no joseph and uh, would would we would you like to have that at a steep discount and i said oh uh, how did you know that that would be okay in our church and she said oh it's well known that you welcome gays and you do gay unions and uh she's so she she had made the transition <laughs> to a more inclusive nativity scene. And we, we, we featured that, that the nativity scene along with others prominently, Jesus with two moms. And uh, so that was a little tiny step forward. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I can say what we're doing, we're, we're trying to figure that out for my three-year-old. And, and we, don't, we don't go to a, a church building anymore. We haven't for years. And, you know, in, in many ways, I view what we're doing with Integral Christian Network as my expression of church and community. So, um, you know, with my three-year-old, we're doing little Advent candles every Sunday, and, it, and it's just our family. And, you know, we light the candle, and we read a story, try to find a book that, that you know, has a good message and, and is inclusive and doesn't, you know, not too traditional stage. <laughs> um, and and then you know we sing a song and do our best with the carol <laughs> that that it also is something that i want my son to to know and think about um but but that's just our family and that's that's really hard and and i see this from a lot of people especially a lot of younger people that i've come in in contact with who who are evolving and and kind of progressively beyond these older expressions they they can't go to church they can't go into those traditional modes it's too painful or there's there's other yeah. things and so what happens is everyone is kind of having to figure it out for themselves. And that's a lot of work, right? <laughs> that's a lot of work. And, and most people don't have the time for that. They don't, they don't have the time to, to create their own whole new expression of how do we, how do we celebrate Christmas as a family and let alone, you know, with other people <laughs> and create spaces for gathering in that. So there's a lot of work to be done, I think, in people together. And that, that's my passion as a gatherer. How do we, how do we create new spaces? How do we find new ways to to celebrate Christmas that that include some of the the good from before? And and that's always tricky about agreeing what's okay and what's not okay from before. Uh, but but those are the, the the conversations and the the process that I think we need to really engage in to to find those new spaces because it's very lonely to try and do it on your own and. Um, you know, most people don't have the time for it. It's too hard. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of work to be done there, I think. Yeah, That's a great saying, point. Okay. That's a great point, Luke. Uh, and, and what I think we're finding in our WeSpace groups, which is uh, our Integral Christian Network, uh, gathers people from all over the world to meet in small groups on Zoom uh, to uh, do what we call whole body mystical awakening, which is a meditative prayer practice. And it's trying to reintroduce the mystical into Christianity. Our, our gatherings are so mind-oriented, usually, in church. Uh, and so we believe it, at, the, at the mystical level, 
uh, a lot of our problems get solved. That is, uh, as you enter into uh, the awareness of, of the God beyond us and God with us in various forms and God inside, and we experience the mystical experiences and the awakening and the transcendence, uh, we, we get a, in the, in the We Space groups, I know uh, Luke and I uh, who start these groups and we get to meet with them some, uh, we experience this inc incredible field of love that begins to develop. And, and when you, when you uh, experience this love and this energy field of higher consciousness, which is very integrative, uh, somehow or other it gives you more uh, space and energy uh, and, and creativeness to then go out and make these changes. Uh, whether they be at work or if you're still in a church or trying to do, handle Christmas carols. And so I think the, the mystical is, uh, J Jesus was a mystic and uh, we are at heart mystics too, but we haven't been uh, allowed to express that. Matter of fact, what, we, what I found is, as I began to talk about my spiritual guides and mysticism at church, suddenly, there were people who came up and said, well, I've never told anybody this, but I had this experience or I have this guide. And so uh, I believe it's from this mystical uh, sense of, of togetherness with a few other people who are tuned into that same spirit energy field of, of loving consciousness and heart space uh, that we, uh, we find the, the, the basis for doing all this hard work uh, that Luke talked about, uh, which, which needs to be done. And we get to uh, retreat to this space whenever we need a, a break from the hard work. And it's very, very refreshing. So I, I highly recommend, if you don't, to, for everyone, every Christian, to have a few people they can be together with and have a, uh, the mystical uh, experience of uh, union and communion and love from a heart source, meditation and prayer. And, and that is very, very renewing. Yeah, thank you. I can agree to that for sure. But I wanted to take on uh, still something. Luke, you said you don't go to church. And I imagine that the churches in America are more or less like houses, not really very big. And so I have heard from people when they entered in a big, big cathedral, which we have in, in Europe, that there they could feel the presence of God. Because maybe also the, the thousand years sometimes of, of practice uh, in these rooms have created the, how can I say, the atmosphere, the, the, the field, yes, of, 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 of mysticism at the end, yes. you know, and so that people yes. can tap into that. So for me, church uh, as a building can be very, very important to, to convey an information which you probably in a, in a flat doing doing church, maybe you don't have. So just to, to invite Americans to come over to, to Europe and enter into one of these spectacular cathedrals. Yeah, you can say that the, the church has used so much money and, and abused uh, people to construct it. You can say all that, but the impression, for, for instance, now in Christmas time, when you come in these huge, uh, uh, trees lightened up and maybe you hear a choir sing when you enter mm. That's, yes you know it's it's heart yeah. opening yeah absolutely so, yes and i I, told you there, I, Go ahead. I had the privilege of traveling throughout europe in in the past and and it was always my favorite to go to the cathedrals and enter into those spaces and 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 yeah, you're right. There is that tension of who built this and how you know where did the money come from and all those things that 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 are real and true. But also there is an atmosphere, there is an energy field there that has existed for a long time. When when I traveled when I was younger, I, I probably wasn't quite as tuned into that as I would be now. But I did still experience it. It was a way you know that was so powerful that that I felt it a lot of times. So so absolutely, 
you know, our, our churches here are, are definitely not as beautiful, <laughs> although we do have some, some nice ones. There's, there's a, a really nice basilica in, in St. Louis that's, that's just gorgeous. But, um, you know, even at Christmas time, though, the, the decorations, the trees, there's, there's definitely something magical there. So, again, it, it's that tension of, you know, the now and the not yet, the, the evolving and the embracing of what is and what has been and finding the good and beauty in that. So, um, yeah, definitely, for sure. That's, that's a tension. And, and I miss that. I miss that. But I, you know, I, I go to Christmas Eve services with my family sometimes in the past and, and just entering back into that space. It's like, I try. And then, <laughs> yes. And it's just, oh, I, I leave feeling worse. You know, <laughs> if we could <laughs> go and, and sit in the space and nothing, no one said anything or there were no, <laughs> I wasn't evangelized to, or, you know, <laughs> then yeah that would be really lovely so uh i don't know and, and you know those cathedrals i've heard I'm, I'm an american but i know a lot of them are closing right and the money to to upkeep all and you know those forms that that i don't know how much longer we'll have those right i'm sure you could speak to that more than than i can but um that that's part of the the ever-changing nature of, of life and experience so while we're there we should we should enjoy i'm sure and <laughs> and and enter into that field absolutely of, and you can you can choose to go there without any mass being held. Uh, you know, you can you can just sit there and maybe you hear uh, the preparation of an organ concert, somebody uh, training uh, music or something. But this is, you know, like I remember one of these. And I was only about fifteen or something in the Strasbourg uh, Dom. Uh, you know uh, that I entered and there was a Gregor Gregorianic choir singing. And it was like from another world. And then I, you know, I was not really susceptible for, for Christianity anymore after having uh, been treated, you know, for, for confirmation and, and I didn't like that. So, but entering in this space and hearing this music in this different acoustics, which you could never have with microphones and things, you know, that's just an experience which I would Hope that everyone can have that. And music is a good way of, let's say, of praying, of connecting with the divine. And then in these spaces, you don't need a pope or somebody who is talking to you. <laughs> anyway, I, I think we are at the end of, of our conversation. I would invite you to... to, to find or do a closing word or a summary of what you would tell people how to live Christmas. I think I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, what immediately came to mind was to go to my heart. And that's something that we are exploring and discovering a lot is, is you know, in, in the Western world, we're in our heads so much. And there's something about Christmas that helps us get into our heart and maybe also into our body, uh, that embodiment and incarnation thing. But if we think about Christmas too much, then we enter into these tensions. And, and we're not trying to bypass our mind um, by no means, but there's also time and space for just entering into your heart and letting, letting Christmas be a time to in, in just feel that, that love and, and also that wonder, you know, that childlike, experience of just joy and excitement and and seeing that through the eyes of a child it can just be so life-giving and we don't want to be too stodgy and, and throw that out but uh that that's something that i'm trying to do with my children um and then just just be in my heart space and experience again uh paul pro will probably talk about this but experience that jesus with us that that divine being inside of us and that that god beyond us that that when we really engage with that from our heart space it takes on a different energy and dynamic that that can just be really um a wonderful gift at christmas time i can't improve on what luke said if you want to hear it again replay just what he said that's that's the good that's the good message come from your heart <laughs> Yeah, it's wonderful. And I, as a musician, would say, go in the good, nice, 
acoustic places and listen to music and even to Christmas songs. Don't care about if they say him or her or whatever. Just listen to the melody and it will do something. Um, music is a way to heaven in my, <laughs> in my opinion. So thank you both. It was wonderful and I hope many people get inspired by what you were conveying to them and Thank you. We see you next time. And I will uh, publish also the website, your website, and people, if you want to find community and explore a little bit how Christianity could be today, connect with both of them. Okay. Thank so, you. Thank you very much. And bye-bye. And happy, happy Christmas to you. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.